Going twice? All right. Well, let's get started. First, a little bit of housekeeping. My name is Stephen Borg. I'm from a company called Northwest Cadence, and we do process improvement for folks, um, specifically using the tool set Team Foundation Server, Microsoft TFS. You may have seen a little bit of that in the keynote. And there's my email address. Feel free to reach out to me uh, during the presentation, after the presentation. I probably won't get it during. And uh, my Twitter tag. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns about the presentation, feel free to fire up your Twitter client and ask it in 140 characters or less. And tonight, I'll go through some of those Twitter things and post some responses to some of the questions that you might have. If it's too long, I'll take a, I'll take a, uh, a blog post to do it. Your job today, my job is to present. Your job is to do your eval after this. But not just to do your eval after, but to give self-correcting feedback through the presentation. Okay? So, what's that? I know. I didn't know what the hashtag was, so I guessed it. What is the hashtag, by the way? MS Tech Ed. Great. Wrong, te wrong hashtag. Put MS Tech Ed in there, if you would. It's 11. That's close enough. Thank you very much. That's exactly the kind of feedback, right? So provide that feedback um, while you can now, because if you wait till the end, you don't get to change the presentation and get what you need. So feedback during the presentation, if you would. So I want to talk very briefly, or have a question. What makes a team productive? What does it mean to have a productive team, and how can we determine team productivity? Some ideas? You meet your commitments. Productive teams meet their commitments. What else? Well-defined roles. That's a good one. We're going to come back to that. Customer value. customer value. Delivering customer value. I have a really interesting one. Those are excellent ones. And I have an interesting one that I found that's highly correlated, and it's how the developers on your team feel. It's crazy, but there's a correlation between delivering customer value having people in the correct roles, and how they feel on a day-to-day -day basis. So for instance, it may be stressed, aggravated, overworked, too many processes going on at the same time, too many projects. Does anybody else have that experience? Lots of projects? I'm going to show you. I'm a hand shower kind of guy. My apologies up front. Overworked. Um, what is that? Multitasking? Too much stuff going on at once? Or just there's so much stuff. You're supposed to do more with less. You've doubled the amount of stuff you need to deliver. Your team hasn't grown. And the deadlines haven't changed. And the deadlines haven't changed. Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks, Larry. Is there a better way? Has anyone here work or do you work in a team where it flows, it feels good, you hit a nice cadence, you go home at 5 or 6 o'clock? Show of hands. Several, okay? Not a lot, but several. There is a better place. I'm gonna, there's some out there. Get, uh, back out. So I probably can't get you here in today's talk, and I don't think anybody's gonna get here, right? Rainbows and unicorns. But there's a place between these that we can be at. And surprisingly, it doesn't take as long as most people assume to get into a good position. To do this, I'm going to introduce a team. It's a team that I worked with, um, one of the clients we have at Northwest Cadence. And they're one of a, a great example of a team that I can guide from kind of beginning to end and talk about their transformation. They moved from a, a very heavy waterfall-centric place, over the course of months moved into Scrum. You'll see some of the advantages there. Then they, they, they ran into some difficulties with Scrum. And it, it wasn't difficulties with Scrum, the process. It was difficulties with Scrum in their organization and how it fit in their organization. So they explored a little bit different areas. We're going to talk about those explorations and talk about a few key metrics on the way. So this is Malcolm. He is the team lead. He's got 16 folks on the team. 
He's a certified Scrum Master, an Agilist, very, very interested in bringing Agile into the organization. This is Malcolm's team. Malcolm's team is um, spread between the United States and India. They feel overworked, stressed. There's a lot of stuff going on, most of the team, not all of them. So how can we get them from where they are to where they need to be? So just want to jet, jot down a couple things over here. In the US piece, we've got 10 or 14 people on the team. Over in India, there are two folks. Okay? It's an outsourced situation, and the outsourced partner is a, a one that does outsourcing for a lot of companies. There is a distinction between these teams. One is at that really stressed level, and one is at the happy level. Interesting, inside the organization. So in this team, this team of 14 folks over here, they work on 23 projects simultaneously. These are all priority one projects, and priority one projects get begun immediately, regardless of what other work is in the pipeline. So they have 23 projects when we started. 23 projects. Um, these guys are really overworked. The team in the United States, some of them are attending up to 24 hours of meetings a week. Okay, so this is a bad example, and they're kind of stressed place over there. Team in India is in a different approach. When they hired the folks in India a little over a year ago, they brought the 23 projects, went over to the contracting company and said, here's 23 projects for your team to help us work on. And the consulting com or the contracting company said, that's wonderful. Which one do you want us to do first? They work on one at a time. They don't work on more than one at a time. So these, this team over here is working on one guy's working on 16 over on, on the, the US side. Over here, one per, right? Just one per. So very few, there's a big difference between those. And when we talked to the team originally, the team in the US stressed, overworked, uncomfortable. The team in India, we're busy, but man, it's all right. Delivering a lot of code feels good. So 16 people worldwide. So what do you do in this situation? Where do you go? What do you do? You're Malcolm, stressed team, unstressed team. You see the difference. You know the difference. What do you do? What's that? Move to India. <laughs> He goes and talks to management, right? You're going to approach management, and you're going to ask management, we need to limit the work we're doing here so we can feel the same way as the folks in India. So he brings that to management, and management's response is, what a great idea. That is a phenomenal idea. However, we're really busy right now, so we can't do it yet. But I really want to focus on this when things get easy. You know, when we have some free time, we're going to focus on solving these problems, right? So Malcolm has just been given the bad news sandwich, right? The good news is it's a great idea. Bad news can't do it. And that problem exists all the time. I've given the bad news sandwich to folks. Same thing. Many of you probably have as well. It's difficult. And how do you handle that difficulty? This is about the time that Northwest Cadence joined the company to work. We had one person working in kind of a senior management, assisting some senior management folks, and a few at the lower, lower levels of the organization working with the teams. And I want to focus on the team level attributes here. But it's also when metrics came into play. So we started looking at some of the metrics. And the metrics, I'm going to draw again here because I think this is interesting. We were able to look at productivity between two people. Now, one of the metrics that everyone here is going to hate me for even bringing up is lines of code. Not a good measure to measure productivity. But I didn't have a lot of other good metrics, so it's something we started with. And let's take a look at what happens over here. Over in, over in the US, you've got 10 folks, 10 developers. The rest are, are not. In India, we have two developers. We're able to take a look at the total lines of code delivered between the entire organization for all those 12 people.
the total number of lines of code allocated to each group. The folks over there, two folks in India. The developers are about equally skilled, by the way. The folks in India, what percentage of the total amount of code written by those 12 was delivered by them? 50%. Wow. 60. You're closer. Anyone else? 80%. That's very close. Um, it was just a little bit higher than that. It was slightly over 90% of the code delivered by these two people, leaving the remainder over here 10%. If you divide that out, each person on the team in India delivered 45% of the code that was delivered that year. Each person in the US team delivered 1%. I want to stress, this team, these are not like brilliant developers and horrible developers. These are roughly equivalent developers. Lines of code is not necessarily a good metric. But when we went back and looked at every conceivable metric we could find, the India team outperformed 10 to 1 at a minimum across the board. This is a management problem, by the way. This is not a developer productivity problem. This is a management problem. So where do we go? We take that data. And that data is the very first metric we can take. Right? So round one, bring in this metric and come back to the manager and say, this is what it's doing. You're giving people a 90% productivity penalty from your actions. We need to be able to solve that. This organization has a, a, a Scrum implementation practice internally. So Scrum was a nice, easy place to move to. So we were able to move the team to Scrum. And when we moved the team over to Scrum, you found burndowns that looked a lot like this. And the beautiful thing is, how many Scrum folks do we have? That's a pretty OK burn down. That's a great burn down. They're cutting scope here a little bit. This is their, their completed work over there. We've got a, it's a nice, nice burn down. It's a very appropriate burn down. Unfortunately, this organization buried some of the metrics in this burn down. So we have this beautiful burn down, two metrics. Throughput, we understand, or the velocity the team is delivering at. Their capacity, we know their capacity, what we can fit into an iteration. But there's one major difficulty with their Scrum implementation. And it's they are an agile team inside of a non, decidedly non-agile organization. So that's a difficulty that they have to overcome. And it's difficult with their Scrum metrics. Here's the main key problem. In comes a piece of work that they need to do. They must follow their phase gate approach to software development. So what happens is something comes in, they do analysis and design, and then it waits for a month, up to a month, sometimes longer, for a design review. They get the design review. Then they can start working on the coding piece and some of the light testing. Then that has to go through another stage gate review before they're approved to go into the UAT environment and have the end users test it and do some of the other stress tests against it, et cetera. So they've got these stage gates in. So what do you do as a Scrum team? Their user stories looked like this. Build you know, blog widget or whatever it was. Analysis. And in another iteration, it would be build blog widget code. This violates a lot of the principles of Scrum. right? You deliver customer value. However, in the organization, they could not get the teams that did the approval to fall into the same cadence as the Scrum teams. Scrum teams, two-week cadence. There was no way those folks came in at two weeks. Is this a defect in Scrum? Absolutely not. But it is a Scrum but defect, a problem that they're having organizationally. And because of that, they have this really beautiful chart, but the metrics don't back it up. This is a sphere of influence problem, right? If I take a look at what Malcolm can control, he's got a sphere of control, a zone of control, and he can control his scrum team. He can't control, although he has some light influence, the rest of the organization. So he needs to move beyond that. And that's the area we're going to start to move beyond. 
Couple tips before we go too much further. The first, burn down and velocity are not enough. You know your burn down, you know your velocity, you know your capacity that you can fit inside of a sprint. That is not enough to know whether or not you're delivering good value to the organization. Next lesson learned, we all know this, Scrum butt can be very dangerous. If you take on the cloak and the mantle of Scrum and you kind of look like you're doing Scrum, but in reality you're just doing what you've done, that can be a very dangerous approach and it hides some of the, some of the key things. So we found two metrics. Not good enough, however. So round two is a search for better metrics. And in round two, we needed to find a way to determine which, well, we just needed to find better metrics, something we could integrate into the organization. Couple tips on effective metrics. Effective metrics should be driven from the economics of the organization. This is a key fundamental principle that I think a lot of people miss in metrics. Getting metrics that don't tie directly to business value in some way, shape, or form are very misleading and they can drive people down the wrong approach. This is why in Scrum you deliver a business value chunk every iteration. It forces you to focus on business value. The other thing, it should be simple, relevant, and leading. A leading metrics, leading metrics are hard to gather. Why? Because they're before stuff happens. Lagging metrics, management loves them because you can collect them down to the 10th decimal point. But they're after the fact. You can only look at yesterday's weather to predict where you need to go. Try leading metrics. A couple other things, they need to be comparable to one another. Simple again so people can understand and act on them. Actionable and honest. Honest means they shouldn't be gameable. As soon as your metric becomes a goal, the metric loses value. So as soon as your metric becomes a goal, your metric loses value. We're going to start with a metric that I find very, very compelling, and I'm going to explain it briefly. It's called the cost of delay. And the cost of delay is what happens if we are one month late. If our product is one month late, what does that do to the profitability of our organization? Bottom line, what does it do to the organization's bottom line? How many of you know the cost of delay for the software you write? One, two, very few. I, I, would, I encourage you to go back and ask people in your team, if we slipped a month, what would that do to our profitability? And the reason why I want you to ask that is because I've been asking it for a while, and the range is about 50 times. Somebody will say, if we slip, it's going to cost us ah, 10,000 bucks. Other people will go, whew, about $500,000 if we slip a month. People's perceptions aren't in tune. And you need to have a common understanding. Because the purpose of software metrics isn't to help us deliver software faster, necessarily. If delivering software faster gets us no additional business value, why not focus on efficiency instead, which might lower some of our costs? We need a common metric. And the common metric is a business metric. It's cost of delay. Um, then you can start making trade-offs. It's a rule that can make trade-offs. Now, I'm not going to talk about how to calculate the cost of delay in depth. Um, there's Don Reinertsen has an excellent book on cost of delay. I, I encourage you to read it. It's, uh, it's called Flow, uh, Lean Product Development. And he talks a lot about how to calculate this. And you don't have to be exactly accurate, but you have to be somewhere near. And I'm going to take a little side trip, because I think it's important. Uh, the, one of the key examples of cost of delay, I think, is a good one. It doesn't come from software, but it comes from physical plant manufacturing, and that's the Boeing company. When they were designing the 777, they did an interesting thing. If they shipped an airplane that was too heavy to their customers, they had to pay the f additional fuel cost for the life of the airplane. It's a big deal. They calculated the total cost, not of delay, but cost of a pound of weight to be about $2,000. And then they let any individual designer spend up to $300 to reduce, to drop a pound. Right? They took it down a whole order of magnitude, basically. 
So anybody in the company, if they found a way to shave a pound off, no permission necessary, they could just do it. No approvals, no stage gates, no nothing, just done. Make the change. Change whatever the seat from leather to whatever, if, it's, if it works out. Whatever it takes to drop a pound. And that means you can distribute the decision making throughout the organization. That's why cost of delay is such a critical metric. And Quentin, I'm going to pick on Quentin for a bit, because earlier when we were talking, Quentin mentioned, how do I judge metrics? How do I know, is this a good metric, or is this a good metric, and how do I know what the metric even means? If you don't have a milestone to measure your metrics against, you're just measuring them against themselves. And that's not necessarily a good thing to do. So we're going to start with the cost of delay. So how did we do that with their team? Um, their team was, was <laughs> interesting. It was hard to figure out the cost of delay. It was an internal project. However, we just went to the people making the requests. Several organizations were making requests. We made modification to their work item to ask them to consider cost of delay. What is the cost of delay if we ship late? And the teams put it in and fought over it. So we have an idea of how much it's going to cost. We did it weekly in their case. Here's where Scrum bit us when we came back. Scrum but really bit us when we started looking at the cost of delay. It used to be we'd start work on that blog widget. And we'd get to where the blog widget was done, say that was week two and a half, and we'd go to approval process. And then when it was approved, we could start working on it immediately and get it into the next stage gate. With Scrum, interestingly, if it was delivered in two and a half weeks when they did their review, we couldn't even look at it until that next two-week cycle was completed. So we were actually adding cost of delay because we were misinterpreting Scrum and not delivering value, business value, in a single sprint. And once we knew the cost of delay, we could see where that was going. And that is a major issue for these guys. And we'll see some numbers coming up later. But basically, the cost of delay for each of these small packages that they were building was somewhere between $1,005 and $6,000 per week was the cost of delay for shipping those. We had a problem. We needed to know what is really happening. What's really happening? We see the sprints. We see them burn down. But we need to know what was happening. So if you're lean, you do a value stream mapping. Or you might, if you're looking at it from a software perspective, you might create a Kanban board, which just sh shows every single state as you're going through. And that's what they did. And so here's their state. And you read it top, and then it keeps going, because it's a long state process. And what did they do? They added a lot of states. So you'll see on the left is to do, the stuff coming in. The next one is design. They're doing some design work. And then the important one is this. These highlighted in red, these are the sign-offs. This is where we are waiting for sign-offs. So we know where we're waiting. And notice what's happening. It, by the way, a sprint can get through anywhere between about 7 to 12 of these items in a given sprint. So there's a lot more work in process than we can actually handle. Uh, this is, by the way, a visual whip for TFS, a, a nice tool by Hakan uh, Forrest. If you look here, this is the stuff in green that they have control over, their sphere of influence. So we're flowing through and understanding this control right here in decoding. Now, if we look down in their story status, they're working on 19 items. This is more than they can fit into any given sprint. It's just because things kind of get dumped on their laps, right? They're waiting on 31. Now, for those of you, anyone here played with or seen Kanban? If you understand and have played with Kanban, you know it's a lot about flow. This is what happened to their development team again and again and again. Notice what is now in the sign-off. Nothing. They held a meeting, and in that meeting, they dump everything into the developer's queue and the tester's queue. So right now, this team is now working on 38. They've effectively doubled their work in process, the things they need to do to deliver value. Now, if you're the team, what do you focus on? 
your next sprint, you can do seven of those things in your coding queue or your testing queue. Which do you pick? Do you just do coding? Do you just do testing so you can push it through? What do you do? Split it? They're now having to be making some very difficult decisions. This is what happens to a, can happen to a scrum team that has external input coming in. Somebody coming in and, and making, making changes or making approvals. So a couple observations. Uh, the first is we're dealing in here with a large, large batch transfer with sign-offs. And they were intermingled with small batch transfers. Any thoughts of what that can do to your throughput? It adds a ton, a ton of variance to your throughput. You can't predict at all. When you start working on something, you cannot tell somebody when you're going to deliver it. Thank you. Other thoughts? What else does it do? It freaks people out. It freaks people out. <laughs> Absolutely. We leave it at that. It freaks people out. It is the single worst way to organize a development process if you're looking for reduced variability, if you're focused on throughput, and if you're focused on delivering value. Intermingling large batch transfers with small batch transfers, i.e., the approvals with the developer work, is the single worst way you can do it. This is purely waterfall. This is why waterfall takes so long to deliver if you go through stage baits. Um, the sign offs were out of sync with the sprint cadence, didn't come in on the sprint, sprint cadence at all. And lastly, they overloaded the system. Difficult to know what to work on next. So we have cost of delay, and we've now visualized things. And we're understanding where some of these bottlenecks are, we can now start to move forward with fixing these problems once you have the visualization. I, I'm, it's a long quote. You're never, ever supposed to put this many words on a slide, but I think it's an appropriate one. So I'm going to leave it up there for just a moment. Developers, if you have slack time playing you know, Minesweeper or whatever, slack time is normally an indication for put more work on this person. It absolutely is. Why? Because you want to fill up their capacity. They, they can, they're capable of more work. And you do it without consideration of what that does to your throughput and what that does to the amount of time it takes you to deliver value. Now, ideally, you work in a cross-functional team, the dev's done, they step over and they help someone else. Right? And you can get things done faster, they swarm. So we needed something to convince management to go the next step and reduce some of this work in process. We have this visualization of this massive amount of work in process, which, since we know the cost of delay, we can, we can add actual dollar signs to, we know approximately the cost of delay. So we did this exercise, and this is just a very fast exercise, walking through how to decrease your lead time. What, what does it take to decrease your lead time? Um, any of you use TFS? Who uses TFS? Good chunk of folks here in TFS. This is your remaining work report. It's out of the box for everything. I'm going to simplify it. Um, this is your, it's, uh, it's called the cumulative flow diagram. If you look here, the amount of work, vertical axis, horizontal axis is time, and we're going to gradually assign more work to people. It's never a linear line, but for the explanation, you gradually assign more work. As time goes on, you keep assigning more work. The course of the year. Meanwhile, people are starting to do the work and deliver it and close it out. Okay. So we have, a, we have this band here where people start working, and then over time, someone starts delivering. Now, this is a perfectly balanced remaining work report. 
I don't know if any of you have seen a perfectly balanced remaining work report, but uh, they normally tend to start getting wider and wider and wider, which we'll see is a major problem in just a second. That in between there, that's our work in process. That's how we measure our work in process. And at any moment in time, we can measure that work in process by just a horizontal, sorry, vertical line straight through there at any date. Zip. That's our work in process. So with that, we can draw a horizontal line, and we get our average lead time. So if we drop something in, how long on average will it take until it falls out the other side? Does that make sense to folks? It's just a cumulative flow diagram, but, but sometimes it's confusing. There's six items, <clears throat> let's just say, arbitrarily, in our work in process. We're working on six different projects. A, a developers working on six different user stories at the same time. Whatever that unit of work is, I've got six of them. Getting faster lead time, a lot of ways you can do it. You can train your developers, send them to training, make them 10% more efficient, kind of bend that line up, that second line up a little bit. You can get them better tools, bend that line up a little bit. Or management can make a decision to limit the work in process. You can simply say, you got three. The max you can get is three. If you do that, take a look at what happens to your work in process. It can never go above three. So we go from six down to three. What does that do to lead time? Anyone? Larry says it reduces it. How much? What's that? 50%. If, yeah, is, that's exactly right. If that line is 45 degrees, 50%. Has anyone here experienced this? This reduction in work in process? And what did it feel like? Absolutely. It feels great. I'm going to come back to that because it's the developers net. Only one? Bruce? Helps considerably. Helps considerably. And the interesting thing, hard to do. None of this is trivial. But that is an executive decision. It's not something that has to be worked and struggled with over a lot of time. But before you can do it, you have to know what your work in process is. Absolutely. And what was your name? Clenis? Paul? Paul? So Paul, for, I'll just repeat that for those of you who couldn't hear. Paul says it encourages you to identify your impediments right away. If you've got 100 things and one of those is impeding your delivery, you can ignore it and just keep ignoring it and keep ignoring it till it falls onto the critical path and you can no longer ignore it. Three things in process you identify that very, very rapidly. We were able to do that earlier. Who was our impediment? The sign-off folks. Right? The sign-off people were the ones going in and going, they, they were our impediments to delivering business value. So decreasing lead time. Um, if I may, um, oh wait, to deliver value more frequently, simply reduce your work in progress or work in process. It's called both. And I want to break for two minutes of math. It's metrics talk afterwards, so we can talk very briefly about math. Just want to remember, remind you, work in process we have on one side, average lead time on the other, and the slope of that line between the two is your delivery rate, the rate at which you deliver. There's something called Little's Law, and if you notice, the delivery rate is equal to the work in process divided by the lead time. What does that imply? It implies that the lead time is work in progress divided by the delivery rate. Delivery rate's fixed. We can't really change the delivery rate unless we train our developers to be a little bit more efficient, remove impediments more quickly, some of those other things. But in the short term, delivery rate is fixed. What does that mean for your lead time? It means your lead time is completely dependent on your work in progress. Work in progress is a leading metric. It is the most, I'll use, in my opinion, the most effective leading metric you can have is how much work in process. What are your cues? What do your cues look like? Think of it if, whoa, whoa, I'll have to not use that for a moment. Think of it if you're driving through um, a toll gate, right? 
Oh, thank you very much. You're heading through a toll gate. And yeah, the freeway's chugging along, and you get to the end, and you're managing that, and you've got four lanes open, and people are checking through. It's pretty good. And somebody goes out for a break. Somebody goes out for lunch. You get fewer people in there. You can measure the, long, the time it takes for someone to get through the queue. But by the time you notice that there's a really big problem with lead time, because it's a lagging indicator, you're already hosed. You've already got people stretched way back. Instead, if you looked at the length of the queue, you get heads up before you have a problem with your lead time. Does that make sense for folks? I hear a yes from Larry. Can I get an amen from someone else? Amen. Anyone else? <laughs> Omar, thanks. I, I want to make sure it's clear. Because this is one of the key things you need to be measuring whether you're doing Scrum, or whether you're doing Kanban, or whether you're doing any form of software development. You really want to know what your work in process is. Because without that, you're not going to know if you're going to slip and be late and some of the other key pieces. Scrum is nice. Out of the box, Scrum limits your work in process to whatever your team capacity is for that iteration. So it eliminates that 100 items you're thinking of. But there are other ways as well. OK, manage queues. They're a leading indicator. And round four for the development process here, what we did next is try something different. Scrum was not working in this organization. And it didn't work because Scrum is, unfortunately, a process that requires a lot of buy-in. It requires buy-in not just for the dev team, but people outside of the dev team's sphere of, sphere of control. It takes people to come in and make an executive decision and push that in. You know, say, we are going to do product backlog items. No more requirements gathering. Product backlog items. Uh, nowhere, no more ad hoc meetings for approval. We're going to do it inside of a sprint. We're going to take approval people and put them on the team. It requires organizational change that sometimes goes beyond what an organization can do to change. And what happens when people sign up for Scrum, but they're in an organization that cannot make that move, is they end up with Scrum, but we're Scrum, but we don't deliver business value inside of a sprint, this company. We're Scrum, but we have a 12-week iteration. Whatever that is, it's very, they, they do things that make it, that break Scrum. So this organization, Scrum, was not a fit. And it was because they could not change, or they didn't think they could change, their external folks. So what do they do? Visualize work in process? They've got it. Now, they want to reduce that queue. We've got two pieces of data, size of the queue and cost of delay per item. Let me blow up that little addition to this Kanban board, if I may. This is for this, the people doing the sign-offs. Cost of delay for all stories waiting for sign-offs. Cumulative, $63,620. This week, $21,740. Nice, big, and proud on your visual display. What does that do to the behavior of the people doing sign-offs? It freaks them out. It absolutely freaks them out. That is more than, it. when you add up this over the course of just a few months, that's going to be substantially more cost of delay than their salaries are worth. Uh-oh, he's right. So put it out there. Throw it out there. Let them know what it costs. Interestingly, what's the behavior when they freak out? What do they do? They sign off. They sign off. <laughs> exactly. Like, I mean, that's, what are they going to do, right? They're going to sign it off. So if you come back and we look at the cost of delay, we simply, and I'll, I'll reverse it, you simply drop it up on the visualization. So people see this is what it's costing the company for you not doing your job right now. And it may be worth it. You may have other more important things to do. However, what it does is 
this. Sign offs went, yeah, question. Ah, absolutely. Does that not cause negative behaviors? It can, because now we've got a metric that says you're being measured on this sign off period. Interestingly, the sign off took a while per, so the, the, the amount of work effort to sign off was not insubstantial, but it was you know, under a few hours. So if they look at it and push it backwards and reject it, that's not a problem at all. That puts it back into the developer's teams to deliver. However, you're absolutely right. Metrics can cause all sorts of negative behaviors as well, and you've got to be on the lookout. Because if they just started rubber stamping everything that came through, you've got to be looking at quality. And in fact, when we get to the later slides, when we're actually showing some of the slides, we'll show one that was a quality, a quality slide. It wasn't put in to block that, but when I look back, that's a nice thing to help it block. Yeah? So cost of delay, what about cost of delay and expected value of the delivery? So in other words, we've got, we've got cost of delay and we've got cost of implementation. What does it cost to implement it? And we've also got what is the expected benefit of delivering it? Those all are driven off of cost of delay, interestingly. I mean, not, they're not driven off of, they allow us to make exchanges. So for instance, if our cost of delay for delivering um, a new if you're building a tax package, a tax calculation package, delivering it prior to the end of the year, December 31st, doesn't give you really any value. So you have a cost of delay that's, that's pretty low, and then it spikes at the end. So rushing to get that thing done and driving up your implementation costs wouldn't be worth it. And you could make that trade-off, because you've got the cost of implementation traded against what happens if we're either late or don't deliver it early. But it allows you to make that trade-off in an educated fashion. Does that make sense? Uh, also, so cost of implementation is a big one, right? Uh, I want to talk, just, let me talk more about that, because I think that's important. If you take a developer or a, a team, uh, let's call it this, let's call it the center of excellence, right? You take your, your uh, database, Every team has their own database developer on the team, and, it, and they work to help with the team to develop everything. But there's just not enough work all the time inside of the Scrum teams. So we create a center of excellence, and we grab those database developers, and we put them in an organization where they can share the workload, right? Because they were only working 80% of the time down below. Now they can work 100% of the time. We've got enough work for all of them. Take six, fire one, we're good. Everyone's 100% fully loaded. Here comes the problem, however, and this comes back to the cost of delay versus cost of implementation. The cost of implementation to have six people at 80% productivity was basically 20% of, of six people's salaries. It was, it was one person, a little over a person, was what it cost you to keep that. The advantage is, when you needed someone to do some SQL work, it was immediate. They were part of your team. A cross-functional team, you turn to the person and say, oh man, can you go fix that stored proc? Absolutely. Dun, 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 dun. Done. Whereas, center of excellence, in order to keep that center of excellence busy at 100%, they've got to have a nice big queue stacked up in front of them, right? Queue of work to work on that they start burning off. So you submit a ticket. If it takes you a week to get your ticket back, what do you do? How does your behavior change when it takes you a week to get your ticket back? Do it myself. I'll do it myself. Or <clears throat> I'll sub, what's that? Hire another DBA to bring to your team stealthily. Send one of your developers to DBA training. Here's what happens. Your dev team goes, you know what? We better ask for a few more. Let's, let's, let's add a few more tickets because we may not get it right on the first go, so let's add two more tickets behind it, just so we can be in the queue. What does that do to your queue? <laughs> and as soon as the queue expands, oh, right, you're, in the, you're in the wrong, that's not a, you're in a vicious cycle at that point. 
where people are extending the queue, you have to be really cautious of center of excellences because they become bottlenecks very, very rapidly. And that trade-off then becomes, I cost extra to keep those people in the teams. That 20% of their salary was the extra cost. But I was able, for every product I shipped or every piece of functionality I shipped, to shave off two days of wait time for a, develop, for a, for a DBA. Now you can make a trade-off. For 100 projects in your organization, shaving two days off, you're shaving off 200 days. If your cost of delay is $1,000 a day, $200,000. That's more than the cost to keep those DBAs where they are and not fire one of them. Does that make sense? Does, that why, does, that, does everyone kind of get why that cost of delay can be a trade-off? It can be a really powerful trade-off mechanism. And you can trade off against other things. You can trade off cost of delay against risk. You know, what's the risk that it's going to take that we're going to blow this feature? Well, it's a really technically difficult risk. What are we going to use, Windows Communication Foundation or BizTalk? Which one should we use? How about if the cost of delay is very high, take two different teams, one builds it in BizTalk, one builds it in WCF. For the, the base foundation, you run kind of a stake, and you try it out. Do a bake-off. And you can do a bake-off if the cost of delay is high enough to justify the additional resources. But you can't do that if you don't know cost of delay. And that's the, the, the behavior there that I find interesting. Take a look at their work in process. They're still working on 13, down from 19. This was taken later. It's gotten better since. They're only waiting on four. Four is not bad to wait on. What you find now, if you go back to this team, you're not going to find that big Kanban board any longer. It's going to be substantially reduced. Why? Because they don't need the testing sign-off pieces anymore. right? Not because testing sign-off isn't important. It's just that they've integrated it in with the testing piece. It's part of testing to get sign-off. The culture is now, I finish it, I bring my piece of work, I drop it, I, I drop it off, I assign it to the, the sign-off person, and they sign them off as they get them, as appropriate. We don't have to measure that anymore. So we've been able to drastically simplify what used to be this kind of, this kind of complicated piece. Here's my experience. Dramatically reduced multitasking, what we were working on at the same period of time. The work in progress, 30 to 40 percent reduction. Waiting for sign off reduced by 80 percent. And the throughput of that value increased dramatically. If we actually want to take a look at numbers, we're talking tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of dollars per month of savings because you're delivering value faster. It's the same problem, right? You work on four projects. They all have to be delivered. Each one takes a month. You don't deliver A. You don't work on A for one week, then B for one week, C for one week, D for one week, and keep alternating, because you're not delivering value until the fourth month. Instead, you finish A. It starts gaining value. You finish B. It starts gaining value. Thoughts? I'm not going to tell you to implement Kanban, or abandon Scrum, or not do Lean, or do whatever. Lean and Agile, however, have some real strong strengths. And they come from the redu reduction work in process and other things. But we need to measure that so we can understand it. And I want you to consider continuous flow. Several of the people I talk to here are Scrum organization folks. They work in Scrum teams, but they are frustrated because there's something missing in the interface with the external world, with the organization. If you're in that boat, consider continuous flow. It might make sense. It might not. By the way, you can do Kanban 
with iterations as well. Flow inside of an iteration. That's scrum bond, a very common um, approach that a lot of people use is visualizing that work, but you visualize it inside of a single iteration. At this point, we've started to move and get some interesting behaviors and understandings of the team. And, oh, I just forgot your name. It was Paul? Yes. Paul, we're happy. <laughs> you know, how did it feel? It felt great. We're starting to see, at this point, the behaviors and the way people talk about their jobs. Instead of, ah, oh, I'm so overworked. I'm always in meetings. There's so much to do. I cannot catch up. The attitude is, we are busy. We've got a lot on our plate, but you can't believe how much stuff we're delivering. And that's an important change. It may sound, ah, it's all fluffy psychology stuff. That's core to getting those teams to deliver. And that's both agile and lean have a strong focus on the individual and what, what it means for the individual. So exercise four was to take it the next step further. Or, or next, or, or sorry. And the, the round four was to go capacity versus flow. Now we're going to take it a little bit further. And I love this quote. Capacity, how much stuff will fit. Throughput, how much stuff will flow. These are not synonymous. Here's a conference I was at just a week ago, two weeks ago, May 4th. I'm down in California. This is my schedule for the conference, or the, the schedule for the conference, day one. It, it, this was a lean conference, and there are almost no buffers in between, the, uh, in between the meetings. Interestingly, the keynote went long. Who would have thought the keynotes could ever go long? Keynote went long, pushed into the Scrum Music Collaboration, which kind of just kind of went by the wayside and eliminated any breaks and pushed into the next talk. Unfortunately, it pushed into the next talk by more than 15 minutes, so that one pushed into the next talk, which pushed into lunch, which made people dissatisfied. We pushed all the way through. Not one of those, am I right, Eric? Did any one of those run on time? Every session was late. And here's the worst part. You attend, um, using lean methods to accelerate feedback at Procter & Gamble. And you're loving the session, and it runs late. But it backs up immediately. No speaker turner over time, no time to move to the other sessions, using Kanbans and capabilities to move an agile requirement. Speaking of which, I better check my time. Good. So it pushes late. You're now late to the start of the next one. But the next one needs to start on time. So, oh, it's just a mess. But the capacity is nearly full. And if I was looking at this calendar, I might be tempted to plug something into those two breaks that are there, right? Let me put something in there. Maybe I'll meet with someone. Maybe I'll do something. I've got extra time. Let's make it happen. The capacity here is at about 100%. The capacity here is also at 100%. Okay. Throughput is radically different than capacity. Freeways do not operate on a capacity principle. They operate on a throughput principle. Anyone know the optimal number of cars you can get through, what the capacity is, if everyone's doing the two-second following rule? What's the capacity do you want your freeway to be? How loaded? About 65%. It's way off of 100%. 65% gives you the most value for your freeway, not a hundred percent. hundred percent doesn't do it. In fact, traffic, much like work in process, responds completely non-linearly to capacity changes. Your capacity changes linearly, the lead time changes exponentially. Small changes in capacity utilization, dramatically drive up lead time. I'm going to give you an example of a calendar. This is my calendar coming back a week later. And I want you to note a few things. 
I, at Northwest Cadence, I do a lot of, a lot of uh, some of the initial calls with folks, sales calls and some other things. And I want to note a couple things. Oh, there's some ALM training. Might have run long. I've got a gap. Then I've got a call. This is, an, this is my actual calendar. I just took a screenshot. Then I've got a call and a gap and a call and a gap. Why the gaps? It takes time to finish up a call if it goes late and you have to rush, rush, rush getting off a really important call so you can get into another one where you rushed, 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 rushed. It doesn't work. Secondly, what if I need to do a proposal? Is that wasted time? It's not. Because look down below and you'll see something. It's probably hard to read. It's, I'll read it for you. A big block called card time. And anything on my calendar that's not scheduled meeting time or scheduled working on a specific project that's time sensitive is card time. And if you look inside my, if you look inside my office, you'll see a Kanban board, a personal Kanban board flowing the things that I need to work on. And people come in and update that Kanban card. I'll call out Lori. She's the president of Northwest Cadence. She's right here. She'll come in and say, this is important, and reprioritize things coming into my Kanban board. But I get to focus and deliver on card time. And at 9 o'clock, hey, if the meeting ends early, I just hop in and grab the next thing and start work on it. Or I go get a cup of coffee or whatever. But having that slack time means a much better laid out schedule. Don't forget that capacity is not the same as throughput. Don't load your teams to 100% ever. Unless you're focused on efficiency, as in from the finance department efficiency. And you don't care if it takes you years to deliver your product or months to deliver a, an update. Capacity is not the same. I standing up and my little soapbox on that, but it's, it's such a common misconception. Right? You walk in, what are you guys working on? Oh, we're kind of going over some of the architecture stuff. What? That's not billable. Go do something. You know, it, that doesn't work, right? You need that slack time to, one, act as a buffer in case things go over, and two, to also give people some sanity. Here's some graphical data. This is from the same customer. And the yellow is the hours for their lead time. You can see that's dropping continuously. If you look at the dates down at the bottom, kind of matches. They're still improving. If you look at the bottom row, this bottom line, that's the total hours of effort that they're spending to deliver that value. It's a big deal. That's a pretty major change. Same hours of value, but their lead time has dropped by more than half. Secondly, this is this efficiency metric in the middle. I'm really still trying hard to understand how to map it to cost of delay and how to understand it. So Quentin, this is that same problem that we talked about, is how do I understand this, this efficiency? This is simply dividing the top by the bottom, figuring out how much time they're doing work versus queue time. You know, they're queuing time versus work time. What's interesting is uh, Jeff mentioned this this morning to me. He said, um, he showed this, this graph to one of the people on the team, and the team said, we got to show that metric, even though it's got a question mark. And Jeff, was, Jeff said, we don't know what it means. We don't know what it means. And, uh, and he said, yeah, but any metric that shows 100% improvement, we got to show. <laughs> well, it may be true, but, uh, but we got to know what it means first, right? And that's the problem. I'm going to tie that back to simple. If people don't understand the metric, makes it very difficult for them to change. Here's another example. Um, and by the way, all this is just pulled out of TFS. Right? TFS gathers a massive amount of wonderful, wonderful data. For people who are doing lean work or agile work, I love having the metrics in TFS. Because you can come back and make improvements over time because you have data. We, that's where we were able to go back and find out, hey, for those two teams, lines of code metric. Bugs fixed metric, any other metric we could think of. So here's a calculation. You can see these guys are on target for reducing the total amount of bugs each iteration that they're going through or each period of time 
that they're going through. Before I wrap up, I want to ask, thoughts? Did what I talk about make sense so far? Did you take away something of value? And what was it? What's that? Have gaps between your meetings. Omar's like, yes! So going back and leaving that note. Anyone else? Cost of delay, calculating the cost of delay. It, it, by the way, you don't have to be all that accurate. Figure it out, any metric, because you've got the 1 to 50 times people's estimates, you just have to get it down to you know, plus or minus 2.5 you know, times or 3 times. Because it doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to be something you can measure. Yes? So that's a good question. So the question is, can we use something other than cost of delay, other than month, dollars, can we use cost of delay in story points or some other measure? And I'm hesitant to use anything other than, well, dollar signs are great for companies. If you're in a, in a, in a nonprofit organization, it might be lives saved. It might be if you're in a hospital situation. It, I'm, I'm leery about using something that can't be readily compared and trade-offs made. But if you can make trade-offs, I love it. Go back over there to Paul. No. Yes. <laughs> Boom. Could be, yeah. Yep. That's a key point. It is not accountants adding up the hourly rates of everybody working. That has nothing to do with it. That's the trade off you make. You know, you can give people, instead of 80% utilization, you can bring them to 100 if you don't care if your delay stretches way out. I'm going to throw out one more, one last, one last piece on, on queuing, the cost of delay with that uh, center of excellence. If I want to keep that center of excellence busy, 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 98.5% utilization, that's busy. If I drop that to 95% utilization because of the nonlinear relationships, according to, according to both simulations and proofs in mathematics, that will drop the expected lead time 90%. 90%. So if your lead time is 10 weeks, it will drop to 1. If you're willing to load those people to 95% instead of 98.5%. When you're at that kind of load, it is a no-brainer, an absolute no-brainer when people are at that load. The co I don't care what your cost of delay is. If you're doing software development, You've got some kind of cost of delay that's huge. Because if, if, if you're at a break-even project, why are you even doing it in software? You know, there's lots of other things you can be at. Which drives me batty. This is another metric people use, right? How much is it costing us to build this thing? And we calculate in, oh, someone bought a new monitor. Someone needed a mouse. Make sure you sign out pens. Really? If that impedes your cost of delay by an hour, is that really going to be worth it for you? But it's a metric because it's a lagging metric that people want to capture, and they ignore the leading metric. So don't let that, don't let that happen to you. <laughs> yes? Oh. 
that is a great question. So well, you, the question came, and it's like, what about the cost of complexity in our organization? If you're doing, if you're a, a XP shop, you know that you know you want to simplify, simplify because you can make changes quickly. If you have a lot of complexity, it might take you a week to make a change. It would take one day otherwise if you had a simple system. Really, it comes down to, and I'm going to hate to say this, an estimate of how long it's going to take you to uncomplexify your architecture as one way, and then you can measure that against the cost of delay. Hard. Did I mention this is all really, really hard? <laughs> it's so not easy and non-trivial. But that's how you can drive some of those, some of those key core metrics and changes from those. Yes? Yes. So Bruce mentions one thing, which is smaller cost of delay. I mean, smaller feature sets, a minimally marketable feature, you can wrap up and put a value on and let it go through the system. And you can get your cost of delay because you can estimate it because it's a marketable feature. A user story, if it can't be shipped, is hard. It's hard to get the cost of delay on just a single user story. But it's easier to get up that. So your move now to wrap up. You're here maybe, somewhere between here and here. How do you get from one to the other? And I'm going to throw that open to you guys. How, do you, how are you going to make that move first? A little, bit a little bit at a time. Incremental change. I'm a big fan of incremental change. Scrum requires a transformational change to bring into an organization. If you can do it, Great, but Scrum can fail because they, the organizational change is too high. If so, incremental change, visualize your work in process. Other, how else are you going to do it? Who's going to visualize their work? I want to see a show of hands. Who's not going to visualize their work? Oh, dudes, this is a binary question and you're all developers. <laughs> you should get this one right. If you're going to visualize your work in process, get started right away. Get an idea. Just, it doesn't have to be at all perfect, and it can be sketched out on a whiteboard. It can be sketched out on a computer. It can be sketched out anywhere. Just get some visualization of what you do. I can't tell you enough what it means to visualize your work. One of the things I love about Kanban, and I'm loving more and more the more I do it, is each item that flows through the board is a story. It tells a story. And I've seen places that do little, they write little smiley faces on cards that they liked doing, and frowny faces on ones they didn't. And I even saw a Mr. Yuck sticker once. You know, you get, it's that story that can be told. So visualize. So step one, visualize. Two, start understanding where you're going. Understand your cost of delay so you can start setting appropriate whip limits, reducing your overall work in process. Those of you who have a pink card, not all of you do, most of you do. For those of you who do, if you don't, come up to me later. If you would like, I will follow up with you to make sure you are doing it. Not marketing. I want to make sure you're doing it. So as of June 1st, put your email down on there and tell me what you were going to do. Visualize your work in process. Make a change of some nature. Calculate your cost of delay. Anything, your next step you're going to do. Put it down there. I will email you a reminder on June 1st, pestering you if you haven't done it yet. I would very much like to hear your stories, too. My email address is right here. And the reason I'd like to hear your stories is this talk next year, I would like to have, rather than quotes playing, I would like to have shot after shot after shot of your visualizations, what you're doing, a quote from you, a story, anything to show some of the other folks that are here for next year. So who's going to do that? Who's going to fill out that pink card? Oh, come on. Who's not going to fill out the pink card? <laughs> Man, you guys are still missing it. All right. Don't forget your evaluations. And if there's any questions, I'd like to end, and I'll wrap up questions up here. Thank you very much for attending.